When I first started nanotech, I did not have a beard, so you can see how long it's taken us to get where we are. Uh, my name is Mike Francis. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Nanotech, and we are absolutely honored to be here. Uh, we view you as our neighbors, even though we're from Texas, and we really think that we can help, but we need your help in order to help us. So we started Nanotech out of a garage. We're a true garage startup. Um, if you can picture a scenario where there's white powder going everywhere, uh, you know, we're in our Breaking Bad outfits um, in a very nice neighborhood in Houston. That's exactly what we were up to. Uh, we sold our first bucket of our product to NASA, blended out of my old beer tanks. Uh, we repurposed some Home Depot buckets and slapped a label on and off we went. So it's a true, true garage story. We're now fully at scale, so we can cover about 55 million square feet a year with our technology. This is not ours. I really feel that we are a steward of this and we desperately need help. When I first saw this technology, our chief scientist, he coated his hand in what is now nanotech and he took an oxy torch to it. That oxy torch stayed on there for about 15 minutes and nothing happened to his hand. At that moment, three years ago, I was so excited because I knew California could benefit from this. I'm very, very excited to show you what we have today. And after we, uh, you kind of see what we have going, please reach out to us because we need help figuring out which areas are gonna have the most impact. So our vision, so we strive for a safer and more resilient world through breakthrough materials. We develop physical atoms. The, the technology out there around apps and technology is, is outstanding, but we build physical things. Uh, we want to pioneer material science to solve our customers' grand challenges. So we are at the intersection of climate resiliency. We believe that you can lower carbon emissions, reduce energy consumption, and have an impact to the bottom line. And we're trying to play in that intersection. So what are the problems we're solving? The first problem that we're solving has, has to do with wildfires in, in the long term. And then you'll see in the short term the, the secondary problem that we're solving. So 40% of all US CO2 emissions results from the demand for heating and cooling of hot water in buildings. Our cool roof coating will stop the heat transfer from the roof into the building, which lowers the energy consumption, reduces the carbon emissions, and provides a return for our end customer. The second problem that we're solving is what we're here today to talk about. This is very, very close to my heart. You know, I don't like to travel because I leave my three kids at home and they are my best friends. When I told them on Monday that I was coming to California, um, I told them that we're here trying to save lives and protect infrastructure. And they said, go get them, dad. And they were happy for me to be there. I only get choked up when I talk about my kids or Aggie football. Uh, luckily the Aggies won, so I'm getting a little choked up because I'm talking about my kids. So we have a, a proprietary particle that can be added into lots and lots of different building materials. And then we have coatings that we've activated into to both fireproof and thermally insulate. You ready to see what it does? So I do these backyard videos with my kids. So they're very professionally shot, as you can tell. Okay, so this is an egg. This is an egg coated with uh, a, a matrix with our particle around it. Um, the way that our technology works, so I'm gonna kind of inform you how our technology works so then we can solicit feedback. The way our technology works is it's a particle which can be added into lots of different materials. So it can be added into paints, polymers, acrylics, vinyl esters, polyesters, silicones, epoxies. The primary thing that it does is it reduces the heat transfer from the hot side to the substrate. So it has one of the lowest thermal conductivities in the world. So thermal conductivity is just the resistance of heat. We resist heat better than just about anything. 
and it can be incorporated into a lot of different building materials. Does that make sense? The second way that it works, so we combine the low thermal conductivity with very high emissivity. So emissivity is just the absorption and emission of heat away from the substrate. We actually act like a black body. So we absorb and emit exactly like a black body would, which stops the heat transfer from going through. So we're emitting the heat away, and then we're stopping the heat from actually transferring through. So what does that mean? So in our coating, we can fireproof to about 1800 degrees Celsius. So it's about 3300 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take. Um, and there's no chemical reaction. There's no VOCs or volatile organic compounds. It's a water-based acrylic, which has been approved uh, by everybody from the US military to some of the utility pole manufacturers here in California. Yeah, I didn't know what was gonna happen when I did that, but I'm glad it was still raw. It also cools down very quickly. So it can go from 1800 degrees Celsius to ambient in about two or three minutes. So it cools down very, very, very quickly. Um, it is sprayable. So as we start to think about, and I think we have some samples that are going around, um, as we start to think about the hardening of your homes, we've done some simulations where we put it on a fence line. We've done simulations where we've actually built the house and stuck a lot of torches to it. Um, and it just lasts. The house that we did, we took seven torches, propane torches, burned it for about 45 minutes, and the inside of the house remained at ambient and you could touch the other side. The other really cool things about it is it doesn't have to be white. So we can pigment it. I know, Cal I know everybody likes to have their facade looking the proper color. So we can you know, pigment it the, the different colors that match the facades of your houses, of your buildings, so that there's not a huge change in the appearance of the coating itself. It's not just the coating, the particle itself is the platform. So you can see a world where we can embed it into things like drywall, into cement, into stucco. Once it's added in there, you would see the same results that I'm showing you here with this coating. It's not just a fireproofer. It also reduces the energy consumption, right? So if we're going on top of a roof, we can reduce the exterior surface temperature depending on the ambient by about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And on the inside, we can reduce the internal temperature of uh, houses and buildings by 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which reduces the HVAC con consumption, which reduces the carbon emissions, which will slow the global warming process. None of this means anything unless it's commercially viable, right? So there's lots of really cool fireproofing technologies out there but they have to meet the technical commercial envelope. Our roof coating sells for about $1.50 a square foot. And we are a for-profit company and we can make plenty of money off of that. We're fully at scale. So we've gone from producing out of my old beer cans or beer buckets uh, to producing more than 55 million square feet of this product a year. And then we can quickly, quickly uh, scale up from there. I'm gonna go ahead and go through, this is a cardboard box. I'll skip to the punchline, it doesn't burn. If we wanna to go to the next one, because I'd rather leave more time for questions. So we have other fireproofing technologies that are out there, our intumescent paints, they work through a chemical reaction. We have a no chemical reaction. We have the highest rating for smoke and flame spread, meaning we produce almost no smoke and do not propagate the flame. Um, we already have the A ratings for the roof that we talked about before. Uh, we've passed all of the military specifications and Navy specifications for toxicity. So it's not only the stopping of the fire, but we don't cause the smoke as well, which is also a really big issue. Lowest thermal conductivity, highest emissivity. And then we can quickly play this video. 
So this is a roof in Houston. You can see our coating is at about 95 degrees. It's 95 degrees outside. So it's right at the ambient. Um, so it's taking um, the emissivity and converting that energy. And then you go from 95 degrees all the way up to 165 degrees. So that's where the intersection between sustainability, reducing carbon emissions, and having a payback. We believe that you can be sustainable and make money while doing it, and that roof then becomes a profit center that pays for itself in a very, very short amount of time through the reduction of the HVAC consumption. This is on the inside of a roof. Um, I won't say who this is, but on the, it's a very large uh, retailer that may be present in this room, I don't know. Um, but on the inside, you can see that it's before the coating, it was at 111 degrees on the inside. So that's inside pointing upward, it was at 111. And then after the coating, it's at 76. So they run their HVAC at around 74. So instead of having to drop from 111 to 74, they're dropping from 76 to 74. That's my email, we need help. Um, there's so many opportunities here in California. We have to pick the ones that are going to provide immediate impact, low hanging fruits. This is my email. I would love for you guys to reach out and let us know what low hanging fruits that you see. Um, we're venture capital backed. We have lots and lots of funding. And so we can put boots on the ground here in California to help our neighbors out if you provide the support for us by just giving us direction on where to go. Thank you for your time. Mike, that's pretty impressive technology. Um, one of the largest problems that the insurance industry has, uh, which is, you know, as a buyer, the, the insurance industry purchases about 30% of asphalt shingles in the United States. It purchases it through claims. Um, and there are a lot of problems with asphalt shingles, um, one of which is the sealing that happens between the tabs. And we believe that that's because of changes in temperature, dramatic changes in temperature on, on the roof. And if that could be mitigated in some way, you could extend, potentially extend the life of that product quite substantially. Um, so I would encourage we can follow up after this if you like, but I would I would say that one is is a huge market uh, if the technology could be applied to it. Yeah, we'd would love to talk to you about that. So we're working with the large shing. So we'll never manufacture our own shingles, but we want to enable the current building material manufacturers to perform better. So yeah, I would love to follow up with you on that and maybe even get some testing uh, together. I have a question. Have you examined how it holds up um, to weather changes over time, heating, cooling, freezing, things of that nature? Yeah, so we take, even though those are backyard videos, we go by ASTM standards. And so every, um, every application has a certain ASTM standard. The coating that you saw um, is rated to go for 10 years. So we've done accelerated aging, UV test, it has 200% elongation, so it deals with um, the elongation that happens in different application. Uh, we have the highest ratings all the way from Miami-Dade all the way through California. So in Miami-Dade, we've done the wind uplift for adhesion, um, you know, as well as hail, et cetera. So everything we do, we don't go to market unless it's a fringe market. We don't go to market without all of those standards in place. And we spend a lot of money investing in those standards. You halfway answered my question, but the UV um, and, the, and the coating, if it's applied in a paint product that's got a longer lifespan, can it be top coated? Can it, is it cannot be top coated? So the only thing you'll lose on the top coat is the emissivity. So the emissivity is a surface level phenomenon, but then the low thermal conductivity is driven through the thickness of the coating, which is why we put ceramic pigments into our coating itself. So you actually don't have to do the top coat. Um, but yeah, top coats won't affect the thermal conductivity. It just affects the emissivity, which is right at the surface level. Yeah, do you have any studies on the application of uh, 
older uh, weathered products, does it have any difference whether it's a new wood siding, for example, you're putting it on versus a weather damaged piece of siding? Yep. So we've been trying to get into California for the last three years. As of two weeks ago, we got our first government contract. It only took three years. Um, and that is for weathered wood. Um, and so we have done some studies on the breathability and how it actually um, adheres to weathered substrates. In fact, our roofing product is intended to remediate the roof. So it goes on top of a TPU, a modified bit, a steel roof, and it's for older roofs to actually remediate and extend the life of that roof. Um, so yeah, we do have a lot of studies uh, on different substrates, depending on which one you're looking for. And as a bit of a follow-up question to that, how about an E84 test on a product that has been weathered? So you applied it new and then you wait 12 months and how does it fare after 12 months? Yeah, so we've done lots and lots and lots of E84. Um, every E84 we've ever done, whether it's on old OSB or whether it's on part, uh, uh, plastics or thermoplastics or fiberglass, we always get an A rating. Um, we've never not achieved an A rating on anything that we have coated on top. Um, we have done one E84 on aged, I think, particle board. And then we combine that with an E119 on the particle board. And then we got about a one and a half, two hour rating on the wood itself. Yep. So part, part of the standards that we go towards do a 12 month and then also three year. So they look at it after, right, right when it was applied, 12 months and then three years. And then look at the performance curves of those. Yeah. So first of all, congratulations. This is very exciting technology. You mentioned a government contract in California. I'm curious who your target customers are out here. That's what I really need help with, right? So I have a very simple mind when it comes to strategy. Uh, I answer four questions. Who is our target customer? What are their needs? How are we different? And how are we going to execute? Everything we deal with either keeps heat out or keeps heat in. So we've gone for different beachhead markets because we're a startup. If, you know, we have to generate cash flow as fast as possible. These tests literally cost millions of dollars sometimes. We don't have that type of capital. So when we think about the target market in California, we have solutions for utility poles. Um, we've been working with PG&E uh, for more than three years and it continues to drag on and get pushed out even though we've passed all of the wildfire simulations that they want us to pass. We've incorporated our particle directly into fiberglass utility poles. Um, because there's no, you have to do this, there's no carrot or stick for these people, we kind of get pushed to the side. Um, you know, we've passed the E84s and E119, so we can build firewalls, but market adoption is so difficult with a physical technology, and we don't know what our beachhead is, is here in California, which is what we need help with. Um, my question is kind of related. So is this a product that you foresee, you'd say 10 years down the road, someone could buy at Home Depot and apply to their own stuff? Okay. So we had offers to be on um, yeah, mass distributed. Um, I chose not to go that route, even though it was quite lucrative. The reason being is any time that you apply this product, you're taking on a certain liability as a company. And I believe in brand value more and the long-term sustaining brand value that we can develop over a quick buck. And so I made the decision that we had to go through certified applicators and installers. So we have a distribution network of about 20 distributors and applicators. We're gonna replicate that to the fireproofing market. Um, over time, as people become familiar and trust us, and we develop that speed of trust, I could see that happening, but probably wouldn't happen for the next two years or so. Thank you for your presentation. When the product reaches its expected um, end of the life cycle, be it 10 years, 20 years from application, are there environmental regulations or restrictions on how it can be recycled and disposed of? Or is it just regular construction demo material pile? Yeah, so we use a water-based acrylic emulsion that has very few, no toxicity, so there's no VOCs whatsoever. Our particle itself is 100% inorganic. 
Um, so if it was just our particle, it's literally no different than just going back to the earth. There's no you know, complex chemistry involved. So it depends on what matrix we embed our particle into, but the paint, for lack of a better word, that you see there is less toxic than the paint that you see on these walls. And one of the reasons why I liked it so much, I mean, because it's cool, so, so there's that, but also the idea that people who need to become wildfire prepared, um, that they could paint their homes or their fences instead of trying to replace everything. And for s some places, it's perfect to replace everything. I'm good with this. We have the zero to five, not a problem. But ideally, you know, my neighbors, for example, I share my fence with four other neighbors. And so they want wood fences and there's nothing I can do about that and building myself a metal cage, which was a plan I recently had that my husband said no, um, it wouldn't make a difference. And so the, my hope is like, what do you, I mean, it's sort of the same question as before, but as far as the market is concerned, I get your concern about liability, but I want to go to Home Depot and or Friedman's because that's local and uh, um, and and buy paint or have, when I have I just had my house repainted and I would love to be able to put this in. I don't need to necessarily say I am fireproof. Nothing is fireproof. I want to be fire resistant though. Do you know? So what do you what do you foresee or hope for? as far as that market is concerned, something we can apply. Yes, so we did a simulation on a wood picket fence and we did a whole brush fire. So we had the fire department out there, um, the fence by the end of it. So we took thermal, uh, thermal scans on the back of the fence while the fire was going through. It was basically at ambient. And then the fire did not propagate through the fence. Um, the fence itself was structurally sound when it was done. The reason that we like the fence is because there's a little bit less liability for us. Um, if you go out there and paint your fence, it's not going to stop your house burning down, but it's going to create that barrier that makes you maybe give a, get a little bit more time and maybe it stops it, we don't know, right? But easy applications like that, where the, the end user can just go out there and paint their fence, we would be very, very like open to doing that if we think that that's a really good market to go after. Well, and like um, Jenny, Jen, I don't want to call you Jenny, Jen, not Jenny. There's a lot of Jens in this room. She belongs to an HOA. I'm just going to out this. And that HOA, um, she's from the Marshall Fire, Colorado, also to a town of Superior, my friend. And um, we were at her HOA with Fannie Mae, maybe Aunt, Aunt Smart Home America and IBHS maybe two months ago. The HOA lost about 80 homes out of 2,400 and they prohibited people from building back fire resistant. They insisted on wood fences and they prohibited metal roofs. It was, I mean, rarely, well, sometimes, but rarely publicly in this job do I say, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. These people have, they, they are just like, this is dense. Because I want to be a little more, you know, politically correct than that. Not much, but a little bit more. So this is the kind of thing, though. Jen, Jen do you want to say anything about that? Well, this is like magic, right? This is so exciting because there's so many people that, of the standing homes that exist still that didn't burn that have all of this work that they need to do to update and they don't have funds. They didn't get any money from insurance for doing these kinds of upgrades. There's no grants for them. And so they're looking for all kinds of inexpensive ways to fire, do fire safety and improve the perimeter of their homes with wooden fences, connecting all of the homes that we know were the igniters leading from home to home that caught them on fire. So this is, this is amazing. Yeah, I will if, be emailing you. <laughs> yeah, if your HOA wants to, I mean, we can even put together, I really like the idea of creating a beacon. And so what does this beacon community look like when it comes to fencing? We can do things on our end to, uh, you know, help with that financial burden, send the crews out there, get it done. Um, I'm, I'm driven by a lot, of, a lot of things, but one of the primary things I'm driven, driven on is this is an opportunity for me and my team to make an impact on this world forever. And if we have to forego some small things um, to help that impact be magnified, we're all for it. We have a culture of doing things better for the planet, for our, the next generation that's coming, while we're also making money at the same time. So please, anybody, we really do mean it. It's our culture. So please reach out if you do have some pilot projects like that that you would be willing to, to partner with us on. 
And a lot of people don't think about fences if you're not part of a wildfire community, but they are often the wick between homes. And there's, and especially older ones that are super dry. But um, in our case in Coffee Park, which was 1,400 homes, not anywhere near the WUI because what mega fires really don't care too much about your WUI. Um, they, it came all the way through. It took the overpass, as I told you the other day, over a six-lane freeway, and then snaked around, skipped a gas station, but then found one vacant lot that was overgrown, and then took out 1,400 homes. And what was the ignition? It was a wood strip along a sound wall. That's what it was. And that's what happened. So it is ember cast. It absolutely is. But imagine the combination of ember cast with a wood wick all around our homes here. That is, a, it means a fundamental change and difference, which is why since the moment we had our first meeting, I was like, oh, I love this. So thank you so much. And please do reach out um, to Mike. You know, we're all here to try to make the space better. And thank you for that open invitation. And thank you for coming out here. Thank you so much. Okay, round of applause.